reductions of all the sexual, if you will, processes and extractions that basically somebody with the technology of the stars has to come to planet Earth for a good time, you know? I mean, the right. point being is, is that it's in our face, it's in our literature, it's in our science, and what it's in your tax, uh, it's in your wallet, ladies and gentlemen, because you and I, we're paying for this stuff, and it doesn't even get into some of the things that we can go into in the next hour because, again, it all relates. It's all leading to the same thing. The end of man, the promise of the devil to his followers that ye shall live forever, that you'll be permanently and perpetually uh, pleased and indulgent, and that when you're basically anything wears out, we just install a new one. Composite cyborgs with replaceable parts. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Well, how much time do we have before we go to break? I think we're just about there. I think we've got about a minute. So uh, is there anything you want to finish up in this? Because I want to get into UFOs in the next hour, if you would, because I think we've got to tie it together with, obviously, the advanced technology and the alien technology. And, and for, for the record, when I say aliens, I mean fallen angel technology right. that is being utilized by the governments. And, you know, it's interesting because when you and I talk about this stuff, the Pentagon's computers light up. I mean, right. it would be interesting to read out who's listening to us online right now after the show. But the issue is, is that these guys refer to all of the stuff we're talking about in the past as the gods of the Sumerians. Well, I think they should actually be more uh, intellectually honest and say this, the devils of the past, because the devils right. of the past are now, if you will, uh, the devils of the present. And I think that people have better get a grasp of this because, as Jesus said, the thief comes to rob, to kill, and destroy. And that's what this is all about. Well, one thing, if I get a chance in the, in the next hour, just before we go into that, if I can make the case that this is now being considered by the highest levels of the Pentagon and the U.S. military as the next arms race, uh, I want to make that point and give people some information they can follow up on, and then we can go... Uh, and to why would it be the next arms race? There's been for some time suspicion that we are talking about the exchange of technology with some unknown intelligence. Right. Uh, Todd, are we going to uh, take a break or are we just going to go straight into the next hour? I don't know if he can hear me, so uh, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen, after this station identification. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. My very special guest host on this two-hour guest, actually guest host, it is Tom Horn. We're doing a special two-hour live broadcast. It's the 25th of June, the year is 2010, and we're talking about transhumanism and genetic Armageddon. Obviously, transhumanism is the uh, vehicle to lead us to genetic Armageddon or the end of man if the days weren't shortened by the mercy and intervention of the living God. Okay, Tom, let's make the point about the military and the next frontier, why this is critical for everyone to understand, because we're not even, you know, it's, it's like they, they, they don't want to build a better mousetrap. They want to build a better war. No, and, you know, the former chairman of the President's Council on Bioethics, Leon Cass, who served under the Bush administration, he made that very point. He served on that. He was the chairman. He had access to information the rest of us don't, top secret information. Uh, and uh, it, it, he provided a status report when he stood down from his chairmanship on how real the frightening dangers of biotech in the hands of a transhumanist vision could be. And I would, I'm not going to go into his book because we don't have time, but I would challenge people to go and read Life, Liberty, and the Defense of Dignity, The Challenges of Bioethics, where he's talking about human nature now is on the operating table. The public isn't even aware of it. Uh, it's, it's being altered. Studies are in place now for eugenic and psychic enhancement, wholesale redesign. And he goes into descriptions about how in leading laboratories, this is not speculation, this is happening. Academic and industrial leading laboratories, there are new splice-like creators who are not only amassing their powers, uh, honing their skills, but out there on the streets, what he calls the evangelists, he's talking about the transhumanists, 
They're out there zealously prophesying this post-human future, and his warning is that for anybody that cares about preserving humanity, they had better start paying attention now because he says we were talking about redefining what it means to be an animal, what it means to be a human, what it means to be a superhuman, and then he goes, he makes this astonishing statement, what it means to become a god. Well, now this sounds very much like something out of mythology, doesn't it? Which was a carryover from what the Watchers were doing. Um, but his warning of the hazards of emerging technologies, uh, it's not an overreaction. And, and there are multiple uh, illustrations. You mentioned before we went to the break how many of the pastors out there, uh, if they were aware so that they could teach some of their classes, uh, you know, we don't even have time to talk about how that um, crime scene schools, uh, crime scene analysis schools like the Birkbeck Law School out of the UK are now talking about how they're going to have to add classes devoted to analyzing crime scenes committed by post-humans. And I read their own press release where they were talking about this, where they're going to need specifically trained law enforcement personnel who will be able to analyze a crime scene that was conducted by something that's only part human. I mean, have you ever thought, Steve, <laughs> that we would read such things in mainstream press? Do you add to that things like, like memory transference? There's this whole new field of study now suggesting that complex behavior patterns, memories, can be transferred from the donors of large organs to the recipients. Well, extrapolate that to merging ourselves with animals and imagine what it's going to mean uh, when you have the memories or the complex behavior patterns of a wolf um, that is combined with a human. No wonder they're going to have to have specially trained people that can analyze a crime scene that may have been perpetrated by a serial rapist who is part wolf and part human because nothing that we know about profiling, nothing that we know about forensics is going to apply to that. But take, take those kind of issues, some of which we've talked about before, some of which we haven't, but now take them to the next stage, past one-on-one -on -one personal malevolence by human animals. Now our own government is actually studying, funding, talking about, and preparing for what they're calling swarm violence by human non-humans. Give you an illustration that people can go to, to uh, Google and look up. There was a House Foreign Affairs, HFA, House Foreign Affairs Committee meeting chaired by California Democrat Brad Sherman just a few months ago. Brad is best known for his expertise on the spread of nuclear weapons and terrorism. And he was picked, he was picked for this, to chair this meeting because they're talking about transhuman terrorists in the future. Um, his was just a, 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 a one of a number of government panels right now that are studying the implications of genetic modification, human transforming uh, technologies related to future terrorism. Well, anyway, Congressional Quarterly columnist Mark Stenzel attended and listened to the HFA committee hearings in California, and he wrote in his March 15, 2009 article, Futurists, Genes Without Borders, that the conference, quote, sounded more like a Hollywood pitch from a sci-fi thriller than a sober discussion of scientific reality with its talk of biotech's potential for creating super soldiers, super intelligence, and super animals that could become agents of unprecedented lethal force, end quote. Wow. There was, there was something even more profound. And this is a peer-reviewed study. George Annis. Lori Andrews, Rosario Asasi, wrote an apocalyptic-sounding, peer-reviewed article for the American Journal of Law and Medicine. The name of the article was Protecting the Endangered Human Toward an International Treaty Prohibiting Cloning and Inheritable uh, uh, Alterations to Humans. Now, I'll just give you one small quote from the article. The new species or post-human will likely view the old normal humans as inferior, even savages, and fit for slavery or slaughter. The normals, on the other hand, will see the post-humans as a threat, and if they can, may engage in a preemptive strike 
by killing the false humans before they themselves are killed or enslaved by them. It is ultimately this predictable potential for genocide that makes species-altering experiments potential weapons of mass destruction and makes the unaccountable genetic engineer a potential bioterrorist, end quote. Steve, that was a peer-reviewed article from the American Journal of Law and Medicine. Uh, well, the problem is observations like those by Annis Andrews Nassasi, they, on the one hand, while they support uh, Professor Hugo de Garris's nightmarish vision of a future where you got artilex and posthumans joining together against us normals in this incomprehensible war leading to gigadeth. Gigadeth is another term that Hugo uses a lot. Um, notwithstanding those warnings, the fact is it could be unavoidable. Uh, those who are giving testimony to the 